It's safe to say that May has already brought a fair amount of change in WWE. Firstly, WWE COO Brad Bloom resigned from his post, then over Backlash Weekend, we saw 12 talent released from their contracts. With a list including Olympic gold medalist and much hyped prospect Gable Stevenson, remember when he was drafted to Raw for no reason, and Drew Gulak, who had recently been under the spotlight following allegations from Ronda Rousey. Which brings us on to now, and the shock exit of 30 plus year WWE veteran Jerry the King Lawler, first reported by PW Insider. WWE reportedly opted to quietly not renew Lawler's contract as a WWE announcer, a role that he has not fulfilled in a number of years. Lawler's departure as an active commentator, foremost, won't be a surprise given the King's recent health complications, suffering a stroke back in February 2023 that has kept him away from TV entirely save for an off-screen appearance in Memphis on Raw last August. So why is this departure significant then? Well, according to a WWE source that spoke with PW Insider, Lawler's exit is in fact proof that the old company is dead. They noted that in Vince McMahon's WWE, certain people, such as Lawler, would have been taken care of. But now in the same week that one of the last remaining Vince McMahon guys, Brad Bloom, resigned from his post, we get yet another big signifier of change in WWE. It was then confirmed shortly after the initial report that Lawler was being moved to a Legends deal with WWE, which could theoretically open open him up for outside WWE endeavors. So, is there a chance that the King could reunite with his former longtime commentary partner Jim Ross at the AEW commentary table? Well, as you could probably suspect, Probably not. According to Fightful Select, Lawler to AEW is highly unlikely, with sources close to Lawler telling Fightful that he doesn't follow AEW or any wrestling whatsoever since suffering from his stroke. If you'd seen any of his WWE commentary over the last decade, you'd likely think that applied to the Fed as well. So save for big special occasions, Lawler's full-time announcing duties are more than likely behind him. Moving on now, last night's WWE Raw saw the much anticipated beginnings to the King and Queen of the Ring tournaments and the long-awaited Gunther vs. Versus Sheamus rematch. While that match was enough to get excited about, and we'll get to that, there were a number of disappointments, namely some significant changes to the originally advertised plans for the show. First, it was unfortunately announced that Drew McIntyre's elbow injury would see him not be cleared to compete in his advertised match with Finn Balor, being replaced by Jey Uso. Yay! Then on the women's side, Asuka was also pulled from her advertised match with Lyra Valkyria, being replaced by fellow Damage C-T-R-L-E-R, -E Dakota Kai. While Asuka's exact injury has not yet been reported, herself and Drew add to the already long list of WWE injury woes, which includes, but is not limited to, Seth Rollins, Rhea Ripley, Dominic Mysterio, CM Punk, Charlotte Flair, Jimmy Uso, the list goes on and on and on. As well as the injury-related changes, there were also some head scratches on Raw, with Kofi King Kingston vs. Rey Mysterio and Shayna Baszler vs. Zelina Vega both moved from Raw to this weekend's untelevised live events for some reason. A change that frustratingly denied last night's Raw the fun trivia fact of being the largest advertised match card in Raw's 31 year history with 8 total matches. And you know me, I love some facts! Regardless, I suppose that fact is still true even if those advertised bouts didn't all go ahead. But I mean like... When has WWE ever advertised something that didn't take place? No, 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 no. That is the old WWE. This is the new era where false advertising is a thing of the past. I hope. Russell Talk would like to extend our well wishes to Drew and Asuka in their respective recoveries. Now, hot tag to me for Raw. I miss that. <laughs> Welcome to the Monday Night War. I could f Dan over. Go f yourself. What did I do? If it wasn't you, it was you. That's exactly what I you wanted. You want to injure him? I want, well, I didn't want to injure him. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> yeah. Babyface versus babyface. Oh, piss. <laughs> <laughs> it's a marathon, not a sprint. You at least got to start running in a marathon, <laughs> otherwise you're never going to finish it. Oh! Uh-oh. Oh! Uh-oh. Oh! There you go. I'm going to play the one minute power card on you, mate, so you've got six <laughs> minutes to book your show. Your roster's hurting, mate. Well, I know, Pete. That's why my last two shows have sucked, <laughs> because, like, everyone hurts. Cindy, Cindy Fluff. Cindy <laughs> Fluff. Gra I'm telling you a Trixie Gambit. She actually is your MVP. Yeah, you just have to know what you're doing. Where's Bailey again? I'm still not feeling great about this show, but I'm feeling okay in life.
This episode of Raw opens with the Judgment Day, or should I say Linkin Park, because Damien Priest said the crowd loves Jey Uso, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. The Judgment Day all apologize to one another and hug it out, and turn their attention to the King of the Ring tournament, and Drew McIntyre being out of said tournament. Boo. Balor says he gets a bye, and Pierce brings out the replacement for our first match, Jay Uso. And if you know me, I love three things. Sports teams that lose in the first round, Scott Pilgrim, and qualifying matches. Jay eats his way to an early advantage, but Balor cut him off with a punch to the gut before dumping him over the announce table, which keeps them from ever saying a mouthful of yeet ever again. They battle back and forth until Drew McIntyre came through the crowd, distracting both men, but allowing Jay to hit a second ugly spear for the win. So I guess in the end, it did matter. I can't believe Linkin Park would lie to me. Drew is pissed at Pierce and gets walked to his very impressive looking car, and he drives away as the latest QR code flashed up on the screen, only for CM Punk to pull in behind him in what appeared to be an old Firebird, telling Pierce to hit his music as he walked to the ring, making a quip about Maple Leafs, Jackie Redman off screen. Also, this whole segment was one take, and your weekly reminder that Kevin Dunn should have been flipping burgers for the last 40 years. Punk calls Drew a coward and antagonizing him, trying to get Drew to turn around in Hartford traffic and come back to catch a beating on the ice that Gordie Howe skated on for the Whalers. Right guy on the desk today and understand that reference. Y'all ever heard the Whalers song? It's a banger. Anyway, Punk says he'll stay in the ring till Drew gets there and proceeds to cut a meandering promo recapping his and Drew's 2024. He says Drew is a choke artist and not like how he's a choke artist. And I think Pat McAfee was the only one in the room who knew Punk was talking about AEW. Honestly, I thought he was talking about getting choked out in UFC. He kept going and Drew never came out. There was never any resolution to this either. Punk called Drew out, told him to come back to the building, and then he just never did, and we never saw anything from Drew or Punk again for the rest of the show. This felt like it was building to something, but then just ended. I don't know, not a fan. Ricochet is asked about facing Ilya Dragunov and gets interrupted by Braun Strowman, who says he hates bullies and therefore the Judgment Day, and tells Ricochet to Go get him, kiddo. Ricochet is a 35-year-old man. Why are you sunning him? Natalia and Io Sky were up next, and this match kind of went hard. Natty hit a mean powerbomb for a near fall, but Io reversed a sharpshooter, sending Natty into the buckles and followed up with her running knees and a perfect moonsault for the win. Really good match, and afterwards, Dakota Kai said she'd replaced Asuka in the tournament, and when they're done winning Queen of the Ring, they're coming for Becky. They aired a fantastic video package for Ilya Dragunov that led right into his match with Ricochet. This match was a f***ing banger straight out of an NXT takeover. Ricochet got suplexed on the floor and that man bounced. He recovered to hit a hurricane run off the top rope and then three more dives. And by that point, they had the crowd going wild and it got better. The final stretch of this match with Ilya hitting the H-bombs and Ricochet countering everything until Ilya backfisted him mid-moonsault a la Adam Cole at Brooklyn 4 was like the best stretch of Raw wrestling I've seen in a minute. Ilya got the win and the show of respect afterward. Raw is looking real strong coming out of this draft. Hooper's up and down the roster, and Dragunov is the one. Sheamus says he'll beat Gunther, and then Ivy Nile took on Zoe Stark. I didn't envy these women having to follow that awesome match, but I mean, I guess something had to. Not a lot of heat for this, but Nile hit a nice top rope bulldog, and Zoe won with the Z360. R Truth thinks the NCAA is a wrestling promotion, and he wants to face the Yukon Huskies. Comedy. Braun Breaker enters and is very upset about not being in the King of the Ring, which I mean, yeah, fair. Judgment Day are upset about losing to Jey Uso and Dom walks in with Carlito. Priest pulls receipts from Backlash last year and Carlito asks them to both do a favor for each other. I like that WWE is a place where history isn't ignored anymore. Chad Gable faced Bronson Reed in a non-tournament match and after a bunch of chops and a Death Valley driver, Sami Zayn hit the ring for the DQ. Gable and Zayn exchanged moves until Reed left both of them laying. This was short, kind of lame. Not much change from last week, except that Pierce is upset in Gorilla, and Reed tells him if he wants order to give him an IC title shot. They recapped Lyra Valkyria getting drafted to Raw. Gunther said he doesn't care about bangers, he will just win the King of the Ring, and then Becky Lynch came out for an in-ring sit-down interview with Michael Cole. Cole asks Becky about her fit from the Kentucky Derby. I'm here to tell you right now, 
We don't care. They talk about all the changes to the Raw roster, but Becky omits Liv Morgan, who interrupts her upset that she still isn't being respected. Damage Control interrupt her interruption, saying they'll show everyone they run Raw. Morgan bails, Lynch catches a beatdown, Valkyria makes the save. This segment got where it needed to, but you could have just cut the entire Michael Cole part of this and saved us their fashion chats. She's not Malibu Stacy. I don't care if she has a new hat. Sami Zayn says he's battling a personal issue with Chad Gable and a professional issue with Bronson Reed at the same time, and will work it out in a triple threat match at King and Queen of the Ring. Lyra Valkyria then beat Dakota Kai in another first round match. They didn't have the crowd for this outside of some scattered chants for Lyra. They weren't particularly smooth together in the ring either, with Lyra's finish, the Nightwing, looking real soft, and it pains me to say anything negative about my favorite superhero. And yeah, Lyra won. Kofi Kingston cut a fantastic promo in the locker room about how he has to win the King of the Ring for Xavier Woods because that would mean he gets to face Gunther. But to do that, he has to put down Rey Mysterio like he's Kendrick or Drake. Look. Listen, man, Toronto has suffered enough on this show. You ain't gotta bring that up. But man, I'd love to see that match. Really wish it didn't get cut for this show for the sake of pointless talking segments. But then it was main event time. Big fight field time. Big meaty men slapping meat time. Gunther was getting backdrop on the apron like two minutes in and my shirt was off and I was sweating. They were leaving handprints and welts on each other while Kaiser got himself kicked out for drop kicking Sheamus' knee. The knee gave him problems, but they traded power bombs with Sheamus' being of the high cross variety, one of the most protected moves in WWE history, but both kicked out. Sheamus hit a brogue kick, but Gunther kicked out. Finally, Gunther locked in a half crab and Sheamus tapped out. And within 40 seconds, they were off the air. Gotta use every second of TV time, I guess. What a match. What a fight. What a main event. I will never, ever, ever get tired of seeing these two wrestle one another. Overall, this show will be remembered for its highlights rather than its more boring bits. It's a three-hour show, but I cannot in good conscience give a TV wrestling show with two matches the caliber of Ricochet vs. Dragunov and Sheamus vs. Gunther anything less than a five out of five. That was Raw and wrestling. Anyway.